Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the money game, where we use only facts and numbers to make actionable predictions about the big stories shaping the world today. My name is David Wu, the founder of David Wu Unbound, a global forum aiming to promote fact-based debates about our shared future. I hope you had a good summer. Mine's been a busy one as I've been working on improving my blog and this podcast. I hope it's going to be noticeable, but I just invested in a state-of-the-art camera favored by the most successful YouTubers. I want to make sure that I offer you not only the best content, but also the best viewing experience. I've also been working on release an app that many of you guys have asked for. Without going into too much details, I hope the decision of Apple this week to settle with the government of Japan over its in-app purchase policy will make my app a reality soon. I want to thank those of you who've been sending me your feedback. I'm extremely grateful. And for those of you who have not yet subscribed, I hope you will be soon running out of excuses. With that, let's turn to the program this week. In this program, I want to talk about two things. Number one, the politicization of COVID, which I believe is the reason why America is increasingly lagging other countries when it comes to vaccination. I want to talk about why I think a potential delay in the third booster shot could potentially pose a major risk to the stock market as we head into September. The second thing I want to talk about is income inequality. In fact, how income inequality is coming to a head in China, the United States, and in Germany. And I want to talk about the economic and financial market implications. But let's start with a quick market recap. The big story last week, of course, was the after effects of Jerome Powell's speech in Jackson Hole, which were longer lasting than I had expected. In fact, you know what? The chairman's promise not to take away the punch ball anytime soon got the market really revved up and investors piled into everything from stocks to corporate bonds, from emerging markets to commodities. In fact, you name them, they went up. Crazy, I say. More interesting though, you know, notwithstanding the party atmosphere, investors took advantage of last week to lighten their U.S. exposure. Presumably, that's the reason why the U.S. stock market, while eking out small gains on the week, actually underperformed all other major stock market, with the exception of Brazil. What is going on here? Even more interesting is the fact that despite the fact that S&P 500 eked out a small gain on the week, you know, the likes of industrials and you know, and materials and even financials got absolutely hammered. The only reason why the market wasn't lower was because investors rotated dramatically back into the likes of, you know, utility, healthcare, the highly defensive sector. If you look at the makeup of this market, there is nothing about this market that looks confident. Another theme that caught my eye last week was the fact that bond yields could not go lower, despite the dovish Fed, despite the poor August non-farm payroll number. And I think I know why. If you look at the chart on this slide, what you see here is the implied Fed funds rates, okay, at the end of 2022 by the bond futures, okay. What the market is basically telling you is that at the end of 2022, the Fed funds rate is going to be at 0.25%. That implies about a 50% chance of one rate hike by the Federal Reserve between now and then. Well, let me tell you this, 50% chance of one hike is not very much, not very much at all. In fact, I think that at this point for the market to pare back that expectation, you literally need to have signs that we're heading back into a recession. In other words, without much worse news, I think rates have limited downside at this point. In other words, at this point, I think the bond market is not going to be too much help for the stock market, and that could be potentially very important. So my takeaway from what happened last week is that, well, the market is lighting up U.S. assets when U.S. assets have been the best performing of late. 
the market is actually getting out of cyclically sensitive stocks like industrials in order to get back into that defensive sector like healthcare and utility. And meanwhile, rates are struggling to go lower, notwithstanding bad news. Well, that seems to me does not bode well for basically risk appetite, especially as we head into September. As I pointed out last week, September historically has always been the worst performing month in terms of equity market performance. I continue to think that there is definitely downside risk as we head into the next three or four weeks. My preference remains to express my bearish view by selling small cap stocks. So look at this chart right here. It's interesting. Just think about this. From the bottom of COVID crisis, small cap stocks have rallied 100%. In fact, it's trading quite a bit higher than where it was before COVID. I can understand that for basically big companies like Facebook and Microsoft that are selling more products as a result of COVID. But for small businesses, that is difficult for me to understand. Moreover, you can see in the last basically few months, small cap stocks have been consolidating within a pretty narrow range, struggling to basically break higher. In my view, you know, investors should be looking to basically sell small cap stocks towards the high end of that range, which is only a couple of percent from here. By now, you would have heard that the August U.S. job numbers bombed. Yeah, bombed. The economy generated only 235,000 new jobs, down from a million last month, inverse expectation of 750,000. What conclusion should we draw from that? That makes me think that this is the economic price that we're paying for the politicization of COVID. You might say, what do I mean by that? If you recall last month, I told you that the main engine of job growth in the U.S. over the last four or five months have been the leisure hospitality sector as Americans are dying to dine out and to go on vacation. That sector has been creating more than 50% of jobs of the entire private sector, basically more or less since the beginning of the summer. But if you look at this month's number, wow, zero, one big fat zero. What could that mean? It could only mean one thing, COVID, COVID, and COVID. On this slide here, I've plotted the number of new COVID cases versus the number of new jobs created in the leisure hospitality sector. As you can see, the two series are, you know, almost perfectly negatively correlated, which is not that surprising. Now, in fact, if you look more closely at the chart, what you'll notice is that for roughly around 1 million new COVID cases, that translates into about 200,000 fewer jobs in the leisure and hospitality sector. To the extent last month's number of new cases went up by about a million and a half versus the previous month, guess what? That is consistent with 300,000 fewer jobs in the leisure hospitality sector. Now you can see to what extent COVID has really been the main reason for the disappointing job numbers in August. Well, financial markets are supposed to be forward-looking. You might say, who cares about what happened in August? What really matters now is what's going to happen in September. And you might say, while well, looking at basically, you know, some of the leading indicators for COVID, such as basically, you know, the percentage of tests basically yielding positive results, you might argue that it looks like COVID is going to peak very soon, and that ought to bode pretty well for job numbers in September. I don't share this optimism because we're now in September and with September, you have the reopening of the schools. And there is no question that Delta basically infects children much more easily than the previous variants. I think there's no question that it was difficult to basically crush COVID in August. In September, it's going to be so much more difficult, especially with respect to controlling the so-called R. If you recall, two weeks ago, I made the case that the reason why I thought the likes of Israel, the U.S. and U.K. are currently experiencing a high number of COVID new cases relative to their population compared with other countries is because, you know, they were the first ones to vaccinate their population. And because they were the first, their population is now also the first to see the effect of the vaccine wearing off. 
I also told you that the U.S. is now in a race to basically administer the third booster shot in order to avoid potentially a very difficult winter ahead. This week, thank God, Moldana, following Pfizer's lead, basically applied to the FDA for authorization of its own third booster. According to its study, basically, that the third booster was indeed quite effective. In fact, that it raises the level of antibodies in the 300, basically, volunteers that went into the trial, basically to a level that was higher than the initial shot with only half a dose. Yet, notwithstanding these news, confirmation that the third booster indeed is important, the CDC and the FDA appealed to the Biden administration this week to actually scale back their plan for the third booster on the ground. They needed more time to review the data. And moreover, two vaccine scientists, the FDA actually resigned in protest of the fact that the Biden administration basically announced the September 20 rollout without consulting the FDA. It feels like we could be looking at more politicking on this issue that could potentially delay further the administration of the third booster, and this is going to be a problem. Meanwhile, I'm happy to basically announce that I got the third booster in my shop, being in Israel. Now they're starting to basically give the third booster to everybody over the age of 12. News like this, as well as the politicization basically of the pandemic by the media, is only serving to undermine the public's trust in the health system. Meanwhile, while you know Biden administration is procrastinating over the third booster, guess what? The increase in the number of breakthrough cases is only confirming, strengthening, okay, the skepticism among the anti-vaxxers who say, wow, you know, the vaccines don't work anyway, so why should I get basically vaccinated in the first place? Surprisingly, even Trump two weeks ago got boo, okay, at a rally in Alabama, okay, by his own supporters when he suggested they should all get vaccinated. I think this is the reason why the U.S. is now lagging other countries when it comes to basically vaccination. And I think this is very dangerous. And moreover, I would argue that the whole debate about wearing masks, not wearing masks, whether you should have a COVID passport or not when you're entering a restaurant, these are of secondary importance that are really distracting the public from the real essence of the news, which is, again, the third booster, in my opinion. You can tell I'm pretty upset. Yes, I'm angry at the politicians, at the media. In any event, I'm not too optimistic about COVID in the coming months, at least for the U.S. And for that reason, I think that the poor August job numbers is unlikely to be one off. And this is also the reason why I'm starting to feel more bearish about the stock market and hence my recommendation to look to sell small cap stocks. Meanwhile, the August non-farm payroll number pretty much confirmed what I've been talking about in terms of COVID as a negative supply shock without going too much into it. Again, you can see on the slide of this chart that wage growth shot up again basically last month. This is despite slowing basically job growth. That's interesting. That is telling you that the labor shortage in the U.S. is far more serious than the unemployment rate will basically tell you. Let's now turn to the second topic of this program, income inequality, an issue that I feel very strongly about insofar as a major theme for basically the world in the next few years. And I think there's some very interesting developments that I'll bear watching closely in the coming weeks. Rising income inequality certainly is not a new story. As you can see on this chart right here, that income inequality has been rising for better part of the last 40 years, at least for the U.S. As you can see here, in fact, the share of U.S. aggregate income basically accruing to the top 20% of the population has gone from about 41% basically in 1980 to now basically almost 50%. Many commentators, including myself, have been making the case for a while now that globalization most likely is the chief culprit behind the worsening income inequality, especially among the more advanced economies. 
The argument goes that globalization essentially causes the low-scale labor of developed countries to either lose bargaining pay power vis-a-vis -vis the employers or that they lost their jobs altogether to basically poor countries that are willing to basically make the same stuff for less. Now, what's interesting about the slide on this chart is that it shows even countries that are known for the egalitarian approach to economic management, such as Germany, Sweden, and Canada, even those countries have not managed to escape the path of rising income inequality over the last 20 years. What about the poor countries? The irony is that despite the fact that many poor countries have been the main beneficiaries of globalization, Okay, many of them actually have seen also a worsening of income inequality. This is very much the case in the case of India and in China. Okay, even countries that have seen somewhat basically, you know, basically a reduction in income inequality like Brazil, their income inequality remains extremely high, notwithstanding globalization. You might say, who cares about income inequality? Well, let me tell you why you should care. On this slide here, I plotted, okay, income inequality against the happiness score received by the 16 happiest countries in the world, at least according to the Global Happiness Report, okay? What you see here is a clear negative correlation between the so-called Gini coefficient, which captures income inequality versus happiness. What it tells you is that countries that have high income inequality also tend to be less happy countries. Now you might say, who cares about happiness? Well, let me tell you what you should. What I've done here on this slide is I've plotted, okay, income inequality versus homicide rate. And what you see here is a negative correlation, okay, that cannot be explained by per capita income. In other words, the countries that are characterized by more inequality tend to be also more violent. Yeah, unhappy people tend to be more violent people. If income inequality was already bad before COVID, COVID made it so much worse. As you can see on this slide right here, I plotted basically the unemployment rate in the US for people with a bachelor's degree versus those who don't have even a high school diploma. And you can see how different the two lines look during COVID, you can see that basically the job losses among low-skilled workers basically went up so much more than for basically skilled workers. Now, surprisingly, because if you have a bachelor's degree, there's a pretty good chance you could actually work from home, remote working. And you can see now that the economy is recovering, that low-skilled, less educated workers are finding it much more difficult to basically get their jobs back. Because of COVID, income inequality is coming to a head, okay? And in fact, how we deal with this issue will have huge ramification for the world economy and the world, basically, society in the many years ahead, okay? In particular, I want to focus today on three countries that could potentially set the new direction for this issue for the rest of the world. And these three countries are Germany, China, and the United States. Xi Jinping is soon to basically embark on his third term, okay? The policy priority in China is now shifting towards common prosperity. What is common prosperity? It is about sharing wealth, sharing income. Well, not surprisingly, therefore, that this week that Alibaba found the lead from Tencent also announced that they will be contributing a hundred billion RMB to basically promoting social initiatives, okay? Meanwhile, last week you might have heard, Beijing actually banned the so-called 996 work hours, okay? Which is nine to nine for six days, that's 72 hours, they said no more, okay? Meanwhile, Beijing has also required all the tutoring companies to convert into nonprofit, you know, on the ground that, you know what, the whole touring culture has gotten very expensive, which is giving rich families another advantage over poor middle-class, basically, families in terms of preparing their young 
for basically higher education in China. Meanwhile, I don't have to tell you, Beijing has been cracking down on tech monopolies. They've been cracking down on speculation of the property market by essentially limiting credit availability to developers in order to basically tame basically property speculation. You know, in fact, they've also basically, of course, cracked down on Bitcoin because I was saying because they're trying to basically in general rein in this whole culture of financial speculation, trying to get rich. Okay. In fact, Last yesterday, the PBOC governor, okay, actually gave a very interesting speech in which he basically emphasized that they're developing an early warning basically system for evaluating financial risk, that they're going to be incorporating all financial institutions in a supervision basically framework. All of this suggests that Beijing is preparing for to sacrifice some growth in the hope that they're going to be able to achieve more quality and more stability. And that is interesting. Well, German voters will be going to the poll on September 26 to select the next government. In case you haven't heard, the Social Democratic Party, the so-called SPD, has moved ahead of Merkel's CDU, the Christian Democratic Union Party. Even the Green Party is now moving into striking distance of the CDU. What are these two parties offering? Well, the SPD is basically promising to deliver a $12 12 euros basically minimum wage, which represents a 20% increase from the current level. They want to reinstate the wealth tax. They want to basically uh, increase affordable housing. And they even want to increase support to youth, basically up to the age of 27. What does the Green Party want to do? They also want to tax rich people. They're proposing a 1% basically wealth tax on assets greater than 2 million basically euros. They want to raise the top personal income tax rate to 48% for anybody making just $250,000 euros and more, all to basically pay for new social program. There is no doubt if you look at basically the details of the campaign that this election is very much also about how to address income inequality, or at least perceived income inequality. And while we don't know yet how this election is going to play out because it's too close to call right now. I think there's no doubt that the outcome of this election is going to potentially have huge impact on the rest of Europe. Meanwhile, in the U.S., Biden's $3.5 trillion social spending bill hangs in the balance. The reason why I say hangs in the balance is because time is running out. Basically, they need to basically get something done over the next two to three weeks because at the end of this month, okay, you know, that you're going to have a deadline for it basically the infrastructure bill that has to be voted on and Pelosi has already promised her caucus that the infrastructure bill and this new social spending bill will be voted on at the same time. Not to mention the fact that debt ceiling probably is going to become binding sometime in late October, early November. And then if unless Democrats can get this $3.5 trillion bill basically voted on before that, I would say the chance that they're getting after that is probably going to be much lower than that. But even there, if you look at actual details, they want to also raise corporate taxes from 21 to 28 percent. They want to raise the highest ordinary income tax rate to 39.6 percent. They want to raise the capital gains tax for household with income greater than basically a million dollars from 20 percent to basically tax rate on ordinary income. All this in order to expand Medicare benefits, two years of free community college, universal pre-kindergarten for basically all three and four-year-olds, permanent basic child care tax credit. This is also very much about addressing income inequality. I'm an optimist by nature. This is why I'm hoping or rather praying that in Germany we won't get a coalition government between the SPD, the Green and the left party because that will do some serious damage to the German economy, in my humble opinion. This is also the reason why I'm hoping, again, praying that only a small part of Biden's three and a half trillion dollar spending package will actually be passed into law. But if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, especially given what's happening already in China, I think you should be looking for lower private investment, which means obviously lower long-term growth rate. And with that, clearly lower income growth, and on top of that higher budget deficit, I think with that, there's no question we'd be looking for lower equity valuation, lower long-term, basically uh, equilibrium interest rates, therefore lower bond yields, and lower commodity prices goes out saying. So from that point of view, 
there's a lot at stake over the next two or three weeks. I don't want to basically get you all worried yet because we still have a bit of time. But I want you to start thinking about it because you need to think how to react if basically the worst case scenario were to materialize, which we will know basically in a few weeks. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.